here today to talk to you about fear. Now, I don't have an ordinance or a proposal for how to handle this, but I want to tell you what I see, which is a kind of fear that it's making people act in ways, in ways afterwards that I think they might regret. Wanted to say hello. But the damage has already been done. No, I, don't, I don't care what's going on with him at home. Uh, he cannot say things like that, and he cannot act like that. I'm thinking of picking up the violin again. I want. I want people to stop telling me that I'm wrong. I want liberty, and I want justice. I want. I want. I want my music. Experimented, and we're just looking to you guys to help us. I basically rewrite until someone makes me stop. I'm always aware of the things in the play that aren't that still aren't working as well as they could be. And there's a saying that, you know, art is never finished; it's abandoned. At a certain point, you just have to say, "Okay, it's done." Uh, but it's then hard for me to watch. I hope that even though it's not all piled on top of each other like it is here, that all of the rest of it is as clearly uh, calibrated as this is. In other words, the way this, yeah. you broke in to speak, the way this scene starts over here so that it... Class doesn't... is a new class that we've just started this semester, and it's called Collaboration Two. We've brought together the second year playwrights, uh, the second year dramaturgs and the second year directors and the class is co-taught by the heads of those three concentrations uh, myself um, Anne Bogart from directing and Christian Parker from dramaturgy. Yeah. I really felt like I knew where to look mm. at every moment which surprised me and like if that is continuous throughout. I kind of had the, the different experience or maybe the same of like at a certain point the work of trying to look mm -hmm. was less interesting than the experience of just listening mm -hmm. but I yeah. found mm -hmm. the just listening uh, incredibly satisfying. We presented a piece today called Town Hall. We actually um, took the opportunity a couple weeks ago um, to sort of seize on the specific uh, current political moment and um, sort of respond directly to that. Um, so we've had sort of an expedited process. I felt like you, had, you have successfully created a really strong character. I don't know much about him, but I feel like he's a fully fleshed character, all of them at all times, and what they're saying feels like it's part of a really complicated real story. And I would say when they started saying the I want, I want, I want, it felt slightly just like a kind of a chorus of voices, I guess. Are you, are you saying that it feels like it, it, it feels like it's working a little hard to earn the ending? Or yeah. to just sort of have a choral moment yeah, at the end? Yeah, maybe. But yeah. if the voices are individuated more, it will be better. Because yeah. mm -hmm. you're playing it as a chorus rather than each of you has something you have to say that is right. different. So. Yeah. Trying to figure out what's working and what's not working in a play is a very intuitive process. Um, and one of the things that I do is I try not to look at the text itself because I don't, don't want to get distracted by the words. What I want to watch is the actors interacting. And if I get bored, if I feel, oh, this, this seems fake, um, if I feel like I don't understand the story anymore, then I go back to the text. And then certainly, once you put it in front of an audience, the audience tells you what's working and what's not. If you think something's funny and the audience isn't laughing, it's not the audience's fault. It's either my fault or it's the director's fault, or the actor's fault, it's somebody, it's, it's us on the production side. I never thought I'd make it to 25. 
Isn't that a positively morbid thing to say? No, I understand completely. In fact, I'm quite sure I won't live past 40. Frank, oh. what an awful notion. You're already 38. Why would you say something like I that? I just feel it's one of the few things I'm absolutely sure of about myself. I'm tired of talking about me. Let's talk about you. What? Tell these artists something about you. What? What do you mean? <laughs> Anything, something I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm funny. <laughs> I know that. I'm handsome. I wrote the first draft of this play in August of this year, and mostly it's been pretty set in terms of the writing, at least for now. And I, my focus mainly with this class in terms of the, the changes and the feedback has been uh, making a lot of notes about what I might want to change for the future in this play. Sheena, I'm a little interested in this issue of is Frank funny or is Frank not funny? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you know, it's, it's, I mean, an easy thing to do is when he says he's funny, she, she, instead of saying, I know that, she's really, she kind of, well, you think you're funny. Or, you know, I mean, so, or he is funny. I, mean, I just don't, I, what, what do you think? I have heard, everybody's like, he was so funny, like my actual grandfather, but like, mm -hmm. I have no idea what kind of like joke he would make. So I feel like that was part of it <laughs> of like, yeah, I know he's funny, but I don't know how, which way he is funny. Uh-huh. I think teaching is a lot like psychotherapy in some sense, uh, in that at this level, what I'm trying to do as a teacher is understand what the student's play is trying to do. If we can figure that out, then it becomes a question of, okay, how can this play do this thing better? <laughs> What I've learned about writing and about my own writing from teaching is a greater appreciation for the world of possibilities that exists whenever I sit down to write a play. And it makes me uh, more brave, I think, to try new approaches because I'm exposed to and get some sort of intimate um, a collaboration with a range of writers who are trying to do things that are different than the things that I do. Did I ever tell you about Edney? Edney Whiteside? Edney? Edney, come out here. I need to see you. You okay? What is it? For me, this class has very much been about development. This isn't the end goal. This is the beginning. This is the first stage of discovering what this play is. You'll see. The next few years will fly by and... Soon enough, it'll be you and me. Oh. And we'll be married. And we'll buy a home. Mm -hmm. We'll have some kids. Hmm. We'll grow up. We'll grow old together. <laughs> That's the way it'll be. It's been really, really helpful to present something um, that has maybe been problematic for us or giving us issues with regards to the world of this play. This world is very nonlinear. Um, time is compressed. You're seeing many decades pressed into one moment and trying to understand how do I relate that to an audience. There's, there's a really fantastic series of repetitions in this scene that Nako has built. What, it starts with names. You say Edney, and then you say Edney again, and then you hear Eunice, and then you hear Anna May. <laughs> Anna May, and then you come back to Edney, and you come back to Eunice. Each one of those is a, is, is, is a build towards where the scene is going. And I, I also think that in life and on stage, you never say a name neutrally. You always say, Christian, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Philip. Yeah. You know, you, you always have an intention behind a name. You never just say Philip, never. I want to present good work on stage 
but I also am very aware of letting the, it, the audience in on the process, that this is, um, it's, a wor it's a work in progress. And if they were to come back, you know, a year from now, it's going to be different. And they are a part of that because how they react to what they see is going to help me understand what needs to be fine tuned within this play. What do I need to edit? Um, how do I sculpt it? And in terms of play, this issue of playing the ending before the ending actual com actually comes, whenever somebody goes, did I ever tell you the story about? It, right. it, it, it takes a certain amount of energy off of the stage, because then we as the audience are like, okay, so now we're gonna hear a story. Yeah. We're gonna have a flashback, yeah. right? Yeah. you know what I mean? Well, it's indicating something. Yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. It feels right now, because it's sort of slow and elided, it feels like the wavy TV screen a little bit. <laughs> like now we're going into memory land. And what, it, what that says to me is that it doesn't matter as much, actually. And I wonder if there's something to explore in trying to pop the memory forward so that we actually go faster and we go louder. It, not louder, but bolder somehow. Um, so, that there's, so that we're not in sort of like, oh, now we're in kind of slightly heightened memory talk land, that the language is the language, but the urgency in the telling of the memory mm -hmm. is driven by the need to share it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that, because if we, if, if, when I hear somebody say like, did I ever tell you about this? And then kind of slowly go into it, it actually pulls the stakes right out of it immediately for me. A play is over, at least the first draft, because I feel that I've arrived at the destination that the play was meant to, to send me to. However, um, having written the first draft, that's just the, really the, the very beginning of the process, because so much of playwriting is about rewriting. So then I want to hear the play out loud, and I learn a lot from that. I think I've done things, you know, I've, I've made the play as good as I can without hearing it. But then as soon as I hear it, I realize I've made X, Y, and Z mistakes. There's something that Stanislavski said that's so terrifying for actors, it's really scary. It's, <laughs> no, this is deep. <laughs> Which is, every gesture should contain the whole play. <laughs> so I mean, in, in, in terms of what NJ's saying, that everything that happens to you is your whole relationship. It's really cute. You know, it's, so take that on. <laughs>
No, I'm equally bad. That's why we fit together. <sighs> you look beautiful. Ah, uh, you are stressing me out. <laughs> and this place is a mess, and now, now, now I have to stress clean. I was really interested in moving through time and space really fluidly. And so the way that I wound up approaching that was by writing really associatively, sort of free writing from intuition, and trying not to censor myself a lot and just let images or characters take me wherever they wanted to go. The nurse asked about you. I told her you were a doctor. Dad! There's still time for you to become a doctor. Oh, <laughs> Don't be surprised if she asks for your advice. Say something good. You cannot do that! You're... I'm what? You're what? You're projecting. I also told her... Last week, we involved. talked a lot about how as playwrights and as artists, we often hide in plain sight. Um, and David actually gave an example where one time he was like, oh, I'm really struggling with the character in this play. I'm just gonna name that character David. And now once I've like identified that character as me, that somehow like opened up um, his ability to get creative with it. And for me, I've realized that it's really deeply personal to me in a way that I didn't know. And actually, if I had set out to do that, I probably would have stopped. So we got to like read this in David's class. And what's so interesting is that on the page when reading it is how it's so clear like where uh, Kelly's focus, like how it turns and how, you know, if this was like a, a traditional play, these would be these like two person scenes, one after the other, but actually it's like a bunch of two person scenes all on top of each other. Yeah, and, and Max, I think it's a really good example of the, you know, the difference between text and, and theater. I mean, this is a play that's a little hard to understand on the page until you get it up on its feet. Uh, and you know, and, it went, and, and it's very clearly directed, uh, in, and then all of a sudden, everything you, you like understand all the co sort of complexity of these relationships, which de which are implied by the page, but aren't necessarily you know you kind of have to direct it in your own head. If, yeah, I saw a Carol Churchill play in London. I forgot the name of it. It's her newest, and it was mind blowing. I mean, mind blowing. And I bought the text afterwards because it's the Royal Court where you could buy the text. And I read it and I realized that it was completely insane on the page and that if she had been a young playwright, she never would have gotten produced. Like mm -hmm. people would have said, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a lesson, you know, no, nobody would have bought it, but because it was Carol Churchill, people trusted that it made sense and it was crystal clear yeah. on the stage. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up really going to the theater. My freshman year in college, I saw some plays in San Francisco and I started to think to myself, oh, maybe I can do that. I found a professor who was willing to take a look at some plays I wrote in my spare time and he told me they were really bad, which they were, and that my problem was that I wanted to write plays but I didn't actually know anything about the theater. But that same professor then uh, guided me in creating an independent study, a major in playwriting, and I essentially saw as many plays and read as many plays as I could over the next few years, and that became my education. The summer before my senior year in college, I was home in LA, and I saw an ad in the LA Times um, calendar section which said, study playwriting with Sam Shepard. Uh, and at Padua, Sam and uh, the wonderful uh, playwright uh, Maria Irene Fornes, they began teaching us and working with each other to cultivate um, writing from the subconscious. So what does that mean? Um, we have our conscious minds, of course, and we have our subconscious minds, and it is most likely that our conscious mind is the part that, uh, uh, that says to us, um, well, you're not really good enough to do this, or who would be interested in what you're writing? And the trick becomes to find a way to, try to, to get beneath that conscious mind, and instead finding some place that you, you don't completely understand. So what I want to do now is uh, 
do this little exercise, which was one of the ones that Maria Irene Fornes uh, gave me and the rest of our group in Padua uh, the summer of 1978, when I feel like I first began understanding what it means to write. So the first part is finding your, uh, setting up your scene. If you want, you can flip through a magazine that you can write about the two characters in the pictures. Then the second part, I'm going to give you about 10 minutes just to start, start writing. And then I'm going to stop you, and we're going to do something with what you've just written. I like to have three things before I start writing a play. One is there's a question. There's something I don't understand. And so I write the play to find out how I really feel about a particular issue or question. Uh, the second thing is I like to have a vague idea where I'm beginning and where I'm ending. And the third thing is I usually have some other formal model that I'm taking as my inspiration, um, some other play which gives me a sense of the type of play that I'm trying to write. So, now I'm going to pull out a random word or phrase. And what I want you to do is to continue writing the scene that you've been writing. But now it's your job to incorporate the random word or phrase into the dialogue. Uh, I'm gonna start with Basement studio. Basement studio. Super moon. A lot of times the most exciting moments as a writer are when my characters do things I don't agree with because uh, a, it means they have their own opinions and they've started to come to life. And B, because um, then I'm learning things, I'm discovering things, I become like the audience member who uh, is being surprised by what's happening in the play. The late uh, Nobel Prize winning British playwright Harold Pinter used to talk about the fact you make a deal with your characters. Sometimes you do what your characters want and sometimes your characters do what you want. So that suggests that the characters themselves have to take a kind of life that's out of your control. And the, um, uh, the tension between what you control as an author and what is out of your hands, I think, is, is the, 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 the uh, question of how to make art. This exercise simulates the process that a writer goes through when you're, you're in control to some extent, and then all of a sudden this impulse pops into your head, and a character does something you don't understand, um, or says something whose meaning you're not clear about. And oftentimes, when, as a writer, you follow that impulse, if you feel it very strongly, that's when your characters start to come to life. I wrote a play once called The Dance in the Railroad, which was my second play to be done in New York. And it was about two Chinese um, railroad workers building the American Transcontinental Railroad in the 19th century. And about the middle of the third scene, I had an impulse that one of them should turn into a duck. And so that's the sort of thing that um, you don't necessarily understand, but if you feel a strong impulse, sometimes you go with it and it ends up defining the play, which in that case it did. We can look at plays and, um, you know, watch a play and feel that it, it was too dry, that it was too deliberate, um, that you felt the author's hand. Those, when you feel those impulses, perhaps it means that the author was too much in control that there was too much of the conscious mind uh, being brought to bear on this particular work and not enough of the sort of anarchy uh, of the uh, subconscious, which, at least as far as I'm concerned, helps to bring works to life. There's no formula for 
how to write a good play. Nobody knows what's going to be successful, if you, even if, if you define success commercially, artistically. So you therefore have to fall back on writing what you're really interested in, what you really believe in. And that makes the plays unique and idiosyncratic. And paradoxically, if you don't think about trying to be successful, your play is more likely to be a success. If a play of mine is doing what I, I dream it can, it allows the audience to see the world in a slightly different way by the time they leave. If I can get an audience to ask questions that they haven't asked before and see the city they live in, the country they live in, the people who are their neighbors a little bit differently than before, then I think that's a pretty good achievement.